Actually, I'm going to see if I can get the presenter view out here real quick and get you into the right view. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you everyone for having me here today and sorry for the slightly delayed start. Uh, with me here, I have my four-year-old daughter as well, Audrey, and I apologize for the, the cough background noise that you're going to hear from her. She's going through a cold at the moment that I recently beat, but um, she is currently at the tail end of. Um, she is almost five. <laughs> okay. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, my nonprofit main big night and about the work that kind of brought me to becoming um, the creator of main big night. And I'm actually going to start all of us off where I started about 20 years ago. Um, and hopefully the sound will work here. Should be hearing some frogs in a second. Does it seem like we had it working a minute ago? All right, well, I guess, unfortunately, you won't be able to hear the frogs that I had in the background here, but imagine the best sound that we all hear in the springtime, right, which is that of peepers and also wood frogs, which um, do we all know what wood frogs sound like? A couple nods and a couple head shakes. Okay, so wood frogs, they sound like, um, I guess I'd call them like chickens in the woods or perhaps uh, duck-like. They kind of like quack. They kind of like quack, 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 quack. Um, and that would have been the audio that you would have been hearing now. And that sound is what actually formed the backdrop for my first main big night experience. Um, my family and I, we were coming home from an outing. It was uh, in the middle of April. It was rainy and it was a little bit warm out. We're talking about 40 to 45 degrees at night. Um, and we pull into our driveway. And as we walk up to our door, there was a shadowy figure of a creature there in my driveway. And it was none other than a spotted salamander. Spotted salamanders are a fantastic creature. And for a seven-year-old kid who already knew he are, are, uh, wanted to be a wildlife biologist, this was like the spark creature for him. Um, I, if you're anything like me, you were rolling logs and flipping rocks, looking for species like this all the time as a kid. And I had never seen one of these yet. I had seen plenty of redback salamanders and plenty of Easter newts, uh, but I had never seen a spotted salamander before. Um, and that's because they actually spend most of their lives far underground, not just, you know, under a rock or log, but usually um, well underground and not available to be seen. So this was a really exciting thing for me to see. I mean, this is a salamander that's about eight inches long, all black with these bright yellow spots. And this happened to be a female that was on her way to a special habitat that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but just to introduce you to just how incredible this species is, this is the only photosynthetic vertebrate on the planet. Um, and if you're not familiar with what that actually means, Basically, these guys can take sunlight and turn it into food energy like a plant can. Um, they are the only uh, species with a backbone that can do that, which is a fantastic superpower. But unfortunately, um, the adults of the species never get to use that superpower because, again, they live underground and they only come above ground at nighttime. So they're not getting that sunlight. Um, but when they're juveniles and they're living in their ponds, they can actually turn sunlight into energy. So this female, she was on her way to a place that looks like this. This is a vernal pool, and vernal pools are a significant wildlife habitat type in Maine, um, which is pretty amazing given the fact that they're basically just puddles. Uh, they can hold water for a couple of months at a time, and then usually by the end of summer, they lose all the water and dry out. 
And it's that fact that makes them so special. They can't hold fish life because they dry out. They can't no. hold a lot of <laughs> frogs. Um, and they become in that way, a safe haven for things like spotted salamanders where they can actually lay their eggs, let their babies grow and not be eaten by things like fish or bullfrogs. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that there are some species that can only be found in vernal pools. So for example, fairy shrimp, they are a species that, uh, actually a couple of species that we have here in Maine uh, that will only be found in vernal pools and they'll lay their eggs in the soil leaf litter. And those eggs could actually be hundreds of years old. So if you have a vernal pool on your property with fairy shrimp, those fairy shrimp might have been laid in the soil before Europeans even made it to the continent. Um, pretty amazing group of animals. Yeah. Oh, uh, let me make sure. I probably forgot to share my screen again. That's why. Can everybody on Zoom see that now? Oh, there. That's mother. Okay. Yes. Um, in addition to the berry shrimp, there's also plant species that are only found in vernal pools as well. So vernal pools are these biodiversity hotspots in Maine um, that do get special protections uh, because of the status that they have. And if you look into a vernal pool at the right time, you might see quite the activity going on where uh, you'll see this uh, kind of ballroom blitz, I guess, of spotted salamanders kind of writhing all over each other, swimming around like little crocodiles. Um, the males will arrive a little early and deposit sperm packets and the females will show up later and pick up those sperm packets and lay their eggs. And sure enough, uh, after about a week or so of salamanders being present, you should see some eggs like this. Um, and both of these, by the way, are spotted salamander egg masses. They just sometimes take on a different color appearance. Um, and right here, or I guess my mouse doesn't show up here, but for those on Zoom, hopefully you can see my mouse circling this bug. Um, and for those in the room, Not changing on Zoom. Mm. Let's see if I can figure out how to fix that. So, people on Zoom right now, what picture are they seeing? Yes. Okay. You're not seeing that? Just seeing the eggs. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, there's a little frog. I'll try to duplicate and see if that works. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Hopefully that maintains, and actually I'm gonna advance the next slide here and see if that works. You see the next picture there? All right, all right, cool, we're, we're on it. Was it down? Yeah. Uh, so if you look at one of these egg masses here, I'll get my mouse out of the way too. There, okay. Uh, you can actually see a little dragonfly larvae starting to eat some of these eggs. So not only do we have like the start of the spotted salamander cycle going on, uh, we have other species already starting to depend on uh, these animals. Uh, these egg packets are like little protein packets for all sorts of things, including dragonflies. There we go. Okay. Um, so it didn't take long for me to realize that you go out on a big night and, or rather on a, a warm rainy night in spring, uh, you can find amphibians in your driveway or on the road. So, you know, you go out on a warm rainy night, you find some salamanders and perhaps you might find some frogs like this guy here. Um, this is a wood frog and people often refer to them as like the Clark Kents of the amphibian world. Um, and that's because, or actually not even the Clark Kents, the uh, Captain Americas of the amphibian world, because they can actually freeze almost entirely solid and their heart will stop beating, their brain activity will cease, they'll be essentially dead. But then come springtime, they'll thaw back out and then just wake up and carry on like things are normal. Um, amazing animal. 
uh, very unsuspecting little guy as well, given all that. And then they just end up in our wetlands plucking like little chickens and they go back into the woodlands for the summer and then they freeze again and they repeat it all over. And then also on these nights too, I encountered plenty of these guys, which are spring peepers. And while they do look large on the screen here, they're only about the size of your fingernail. Um, and that's pretty remarkable given how loud they can actually be. They are our smallest frog, but certainly our loudest. Um, I'm sure a couple of us here, and hopefully a lot of us have been around a wetland where peepers were so loud that your ears were actually in some level of pain. <laughs> which, you know, it's it, it's a pain that you kind of love, I think. I, I don't get to experience that enough these days, but um, peepers tend to be the most common thing I encountered while I was out there look, uh, looking. Uh, but, you know, once you get a night where you find some spotted salamanders, you find some wood frogs, you find some peepers, maybe you find a couple other species smattered in there, all of these things moving at the same time, you get what's called a big night. So a big night is a night where things just come together and you have all sorts of amphibians moving at the same time. And there's a reason that they all move at the same time. And it's because amphibians are very sensitive to the environment around them. Uh, amphibians are not warm blooded, right? They can't make their own body heat. They are essentially fish that learned to live on land. They require water in order to be on land. Otherwise they can dry out very quickly. So a big night happens because a few things come together to allow amphibians to be out and moving and thriving in this um, uh, on land. First of all, it needs to be springtime because that's when a lot of these amphibians are gonna be breeding. Um, and for Maine, our big nights typically fall in mid-April, but I will say in recent years, it's been following, uh, follow, excuse me, falling a little bit earlier, probably like the first or second week of April. Although this year, given how early spring has been, I'm willing to bet that it's probably gonna be the last week of March that we'll see some of our biggest movements. The ground does need to be thawed and that's because a lot of amphibians, they require, um, or rather they are spending their winter in the soil. So if it's still frozen, they can't escape it. Um, plus it takes a lot of energy to heat up the ground enough. So it's kind of like a fail safe where like, uh, sometimes we get these warm spells, right, in the middle of January or February, and a salamander might come out if it's not buried deep enough in the soil, and it might think, oh, it's like 50 or 60 degrees out, it's probably time for me to start moving, but it's February, right? So it's not really going to be a, a safe time for an amphibian to move. There's going to be a cold snap in like two days. Um, but if the ground is thawed, that's almost a surefire sign that we're actually pretty far into springtime and it's safe to emerge. And again, these are essentially fish that learn to live on land. So it needs to be wet and rain is kind of like a siren call for amphibians. Um, it doesn't need to be raining hard. It just needs to be enough to make the ground wet. And then it needs to be a temperature of around 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, uh, amphibians, they can't make their own body temperature. So they have to rely on the environment around them. And as it turns out, somewhere between about 40 and 50 degrees is what really kicks off the movements for amphibians. So if all of these things come together, then you can have a night that looks kind of like this. And this is a picture from one of our volunteers. Uh, there's actually three species of amphibians in this picture, but most of them are wood frogs. Uh, there's also spotted salamanders as well as blue spotted salamanders, but it can be a heck of a big night if you get all of these conditions at the right time. And just to give you some context for how incredible these migrations are, if we correct an amphibian's distance that it migrates by how much it weighs. Amphibian migrations are equivalent to that of woodland caribou migrations, which are traveling 400 miles. Um, so these amphibians are essentially traveling 400 amphibian miles. Um, they're actually 13 times longer than the wildebeest migrations in the Serengeti. And that's perhaps one of the most famous migration events uh, of all time. If you watched any wildlife documentary, you've probably seen those scenes of wildebeest like jumping across these rivers and getting eaten by crocodiles and then dodging lions on the other side. Uh, this is 13 times greater than that one. So this is happening in our backyards and just putting it in a more uh, human context, I guess, most of these guys are only migrating about a kilometer or less. So that's about a thousand feet uh, or no, uh, I forget how many feet, like 3000. Um, Oh yes, 3,000 feet, perfect, I put it on the slide. <laughs> um, so it's not too far for us. That's something that you can walk in a matter of a couple of minutes, but for something that is, you know, three inches long, that's quite a trek to make. 
And uh, it, it's a lot of fun to be out there tracking these amphibians as they make their way across the landscape. And certainly roads are one of the best ways to find these guys. They're relatively exposed and easy to find. Uh, but it did not take long for young me to find that amphibians were facing a pretty big problem as they started crossing these roads because a lot of them ended up like this guy here. Unfortunately, a lot of amphibians are hit as they cross roads. Um, but some people have asked me, are roads really that much of an issue for amphibians? And that's something that I want to walk through with all of you so they understand where amphibians do follow this because not all species are impacted by roads equally. So if we take white-tailed deer, for an example, white-tailed deer are hit by cars all the time. Uh, you know, you see dead deer on the side of the highway relatively frequently, uh, but relatively speaking, there's been no noticeable population decline uh, in white-tailed deer due to roads. In fact, uh, this is surprising, even given the fact that they are breeding more slowly than amphibians. A, a white-tailed deer female might produce one, maybe two fawns in a season, whereas a female salamander might produce, you know, 300 eggs in a, a spring. So um, surprising given that they're breeding so slowly by comparison. Uh, also consider the fact too that deer, roadside habitats, are actually excellent for deer. Uh, they're good for grazing and they're pretty much predator free. A lot of coyotes or anything else that might be going after a deer tends to be fairly shy around roadsides. So deer have it made when it comes to roads. Uh, but unfortunately amphibians have it a lot worse. And why that is, I'm gonna dive in uh, into with you, but to start thinking about it, I want you all to think how many deer have you hit before? And odds are you can probably think of exactly the correct number of deer you've hit because you know it when you hit a deer, right? It, you know, banks up your car. Hopefully it doesn't hurt you, but you know it when it happens. But how many frogs and salamanders have you hit before? Nobody knows. I, I don't know because you just can't see it. You don't feel it. It doesn't harm your car. So it's possible that you can be running over hundreds or possibly even thousands of amphibians in your lifetime. Now, I want to walk through a few road ecology basics with you to further illustrate why roads are an issue for amphibians. Um, the first one being that animals all respond to roads differently. And I, I spoke a little bit already about this, but some animals avoid roads, typically your predators. Um, if a car is coming, they typically just go the other way and they will only cross a road when there's essentially no traffic. So that will be things like bears and mountain lions. Uh, some species will travel cro uh, cross roads quickly when a car is coming. So if a deer is coming up to a road and it sees a car coming, uh, sometimes it might, you know, double back and go back into the woods and wait. But frequently, they'll just run across the road as fast as they can. That tends to be their response. Some will freeze in response to roads where if a car is coming, they'll just freeze on the side. Or unfortunately, as we see fr uh, frequently with squirrels, they freeze in the middle of the road. Um, that tends to be a lot of our small mammals. But then there's a group that is essentially oblivious to traffic. They're unable to assess cars as a threat. And that, unfortunately, is our amphibians. Even if you are in rush hour traffic, an amphibian will still attempt to cross. It has no idea what it's getting itself into. Wow. Now, consider that, too, with the fact that roads are everywhere. And when I mean everywhere, I'm talking about an entire fifth of the planet is affected by roads. So while only 1% of the Earth's surface is co covered by asphalt, a full 20% is actually affected by the road directly. We have what's called a road effect zone. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, pollutants, sound, habitat changes all happen when a road is put in place. Um, and when you think about roads too, uh, bisecting all these habitats, you get these wildlife that need to cross all these roads at these different points and looking especially at the northeast how much a deer or a salamander might need to be crossing a road you get a lot of wildlife collisions and uh, unfortunately that's costing american taxpayers about eight billion dollars per year um, and that's going to come back again later I'll, I'll talk about why that's important and i know that amphibians are not damaging anyone's cars but we can talk about uh, amphibians with other wildlife in a different context um, another road ecology point is that roads are also unfair predators. Uh, natural predators tend to take out things that are either sick or dying or elderly. 
roads will take out anything that's on the road. Um, so unfortunately that reduces the overall population health of a lot of species that are being impacted by roads. And we can even see this in how some of these animals are breeding. So for example, uh, spotted salamanders, again, the populations that live closer to roads tend to lay less eggs and their eggs tend to be smaller. That's because the healthy females are the ones that are getting hit and it's the less healthy ones that are remaining uh, to breed. And I mentioned this a little bit already too, but roads are a very noisy thing to have in the environment. Tire noise is actually a lot louder than a motor noise and tire noise can carry for potentially miles in the correct uh, circumstances. And consider too where frogs need to be able to hear each other when they breed. So if you have a really busy highway or uh, even a state route, sometimes frogs are unable to hear each other when they're trying to breed. And so breeding is not able to occur in some instances. And then if you are right next to a loud, noisy thing, you might not be in the best state of mind, I guess you could say. Um, this is true of humans too. Humans that live next to a noisy road, they tend to have a life expect expectancy that's reduced by up to three years. Uh, so when we're talking about a frog that's used to something that's supposed to be entirely quiet around them, they're pretty stressed. And even their immune systems are being compromised by being too close to roads and being stressed by noise around them. So we have a lot that's coming together to impact amphibians about roads. Uh, but perhaps one of the, the most damaging things is that roads are almost these impassable barriers at times. Yes, some of them do cross successfully, but if you think about a road that has high traffic, um, that might as well be a you know, fast flowing river or um, uh, an impassable mountain range. So this is causing populations to be separated and unable to reach each other to breed, unable to access um, the resources that are on either side. And we get uh, what we kind of call an extinction vortex starting to form. So first of all, we have a group that is separated. It has less access to resources. They can't breed with others and gain that genetic information that kind of keeps them going. Uh, the reduced population size and isolation can eventually lead to inbreeding. And then habitat is reduced in quality as well. So we have what's called um, the edge effects when we're talking about habitat, where when you put a road in uh, place somewhere, um, the let's say you cut through like a perfect like old growth forest, the interior of that forest is now exposed to <clears throat> sunlight, more heat, moisture gets reduced, and then species that would not occur in the interior of that forest can now actually thrive there. So the entire ecology of some of these habitats are getting changed. So all this comes together and creates what we call this extinction vortex, where essentially amphibians get left with this suite of problems that build off each other and they're unable to fight it. And they end up kind of going down this rabbit hole of not being able to escape. And we end up with populations that disappear. They get choked out by roads. And just to uh, drive this home, this is something that is happening in Maine, even though we have relatively low traffic and certainly relatively low road coverage, it does not take much to cause this. A uh, rural is county Diane actually about as damaging as a highway, um, but just to strangely family medicine? make it as... Um, Diane Zavatsky, for everybody. Isn't that there the was a, a paper from 2019 yet, so some folks at uh, University of Maine, where, where I'm at. I don't know when I they pull were doing up a, a genetic study on wood frogs and spotted salamanders, and they had found that uh, either of those amphibians on either side of I-95 were genetically distinct from each other, and that highway has only been there for 60 years, and we're seeing a population response that we would only expect. Um, over the course of hundreds, maybe thousands of years in a natural system. So there's a lot of pressure coming from these highways. And this is also something that we can see, like I said, in more rural roads as well. Um, they didn't specifically list like a certain road or something um, where there was a distinction on either side, but they had found evidence to say that even on rural roads on either side, you can see some genetic uh, differentiation. Um, and this is also really important too, because it doesn't take much to drive an amphibian population to extinction from roads. So you only need to take out one out of every 10 spotted salamanders over the course, uh, course of a few years to drive it to extinction uh, within 20 years, basically. Um, it's kind of a confusing mathematics thing. It's called a population viability analysis. But uh, if one out of every 10 spotted salamanders is killed on the road every year, that population will disappear in about 25 years. 
Um, and I am going to forewarn that most of our roads that I've assessed are about double that mortality rate. Um, so a lot of our amphibians might not be in a, a very good posture at the moment. And just to wrap up some important amphibian road stats here while I, I keep drilling like the road ecology things, um, there was a study out of Canada that studied this uh, stretch of road in, I think it was one of the national parks, I, I forget which one, it might have been Banff, um, but there were 30,000 amphibians that were found killed over the course of four years there. And somebody might ask like, okay, is that a large, uh, large proportion of that population? And it is. And not only that, but it's also primarily juveniles that are being hit. And juveniles are the ones that drive amphibian populations to thrive. If you take out juveniles every year, that population will crash quickly. They actually carry more weight in the population than adults. And this is uh, this fact here is true of Maine um, as well as most other areas, but an amphibian will face about a one in five chance of being hit by a car every time it crosses a road. So a 21% mortality rate is another one, a way of saying that. Uh, but some roads can approach about a 100% chance of mortality. So anytime an amphibian tries to cross that road, it will be hit. Um, those are roads with high traffic and typically multi-lane. Um, and, and this was uh, a fact that I had shown on the <laughs> tissue kiddo. Do you know where the bathroom is? Uh, let's see, do we have tissues in the house here somewhere? Um, and while we get the tissues out, I'll just hit this fact real quick. So killing 10% of adults per year will cause a population to disappear in about 25 years. Uh, this is a stat that's built off of spotted salamanders, but could also potentially be true for wood frogs. It's likely that uh, wood frogs will last a little bit longer because they can breed a little bit more. Thank you so much for the tissues. <laughs> uh, so I've told you that big nights and amphibians, they're getting impacted pretty heavily. Um, but why do we care? A lot of people have difficulty caring about amphibians because, you know, again, if you hit an amphibian with your car, it's not destroying your car. You don't have to go to a mechanic. Um, if you hit an amphibian, it's not like you saw that amphibian before and now you're missing something from your property that you miss a lot. Uh, it, it's hard to get people to care about something that has a face that looks like that as well. So just to kind of hammer this home, and, and by the way, I think that's adorable. I, I hope most of us here agree, but uh, perhaps not all of us. Um, so to hammer home why this is important, not only to us, but to uh, the entire uh, ecosystem, first of all, amphibians are ecological indicators, and this is probably something most of us have heard at one point or another, where frogs and salamanders, they're the cannery in the coal mine when something is wrong in the environment. Um, they can absorb basically everything through their skin. So if there's a pollutant out there, they're absorbing it and they might be growing a third leg, they might be dying. Um, and actually we're gonna talk about pollutants here again uh, in a little bit. Uh, but this is another thing that most people already recognize about amphibians, but I gotta make sure I hit it anyway. Amphibians are one of the primary predators of insects out there. Um, in fact, the favorite snack of a young spotted salamander is mosquito larvae. They are cleaning out mosquitoes for us in the springtime. Um, and one can only imagine how much worse mosquitoes would be without our amphibians. And this is a cool one. I, I got a cool story about this, but um, they're a food source for many predators. They're pretty much the chicken McNuggets of the forest. They're these small little protein packets that are walking around in the woods. And especially during big nights, they're particularly exposed and a lot of species might be feasting on them. And uh, this is my cool story. I actually just talked with the raptor biologist from IFMW. I was sitting next to her in a, a course the other day, and um, she told me that somebody had turned in a, a barred owl that got hit on a road, and they did a necropsy, and they opened up the crop to see what was being eaten by this barred owl, and that crop was primarily filled with amphibians. It was spring peepers and eastern redback salamanders, and we have barely had any amphibians moving already, but barred owls are on it. They know when things are moving. And certainly one of the best times that I have ever seen uh, barred owls are during big nights. I hear them call frequently during big nights. I see them somewhat frequently on the roads during big nights as well, chasing down frogs and salamanders. Uh, but owls aren't the only things that are eating these things. There's bears, coyotes, foxes, skunks, raccoons, uh, fishers, mink, uh, 
it basically if it eats meat, it will eat a frog or salamander. Um, this is a little bit out of my realm, but something that definitely demands thinking. So amphibians, if you were to take all the amphibians in a forest and put them on one side of a scale and then put all the other things with a backbone on the other side of the scale, so birds and mammals, amphibians would outweigh all those birds and mammals. And I'm talking including bear, moose, deer, and everything on that side of the scale. Amphibians would still outweigh them. They are that numerous in the forest. So if you think about moving all of these amphibians from the forest to a vernal pool or some sort of migration occurring, think about how that might be changing the environment that they're in. Uh, it, you might be seeing changes in nutrient flow. You might be seeing changes in energy flow, things that we haven't really started wrapping our fingers around yet. And like these are things that we know happen with bird migrations, right? Like bird migrations are massive. Uh, they move a whole lot of energy from point A to point B, and they bring all sorts of new nutrients to places when they start defecating. Um, amphibians probably doing the same thing, but nobody has really quantified this yet. And in that same vein, amphibians are actually one of the best climate change fighters that we have out there. Because again, amphibians eat insects, and a lot of insects eat leaves and wood. And when they do that, they're keeping the carbon from those leaves and wood circulating above the surface of the earth. So when amphibians eat those insects, they allow that stuff to sink below the Earth's surface into the soil and get locked beneath the soil instead of keeping it circulating above. Um, so they're pulling carbon out of essentially what's the atmosphere and sinking it below into the soil. Um, I forget what the stat is. It's like one salamander can sequester something like 70 pounds of carbon per uh, I forget how many square feet of forest, but it, it's a fair amount because of how many insects that they're actually eating in these areas. So a lot of things are depending on amphibians and a lot of things are depending on this big night to go off without a hitch. Uh, so you can get big nights where it's a boom year or a bust year, depending on how things go. Um, so how we can go about helping amphibians, there's a few different ways. Uh, but basically, it comes down to this model that I, I like a lot because it rhymes, but it's the collect, protect, and connect model. And uh, it's a simple three-step model. Um, this is essentially how all wildlife uh, conservation stuff works. But we start with a collection phase, which is something that we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, but we collect data about where these migrations are happening and where conservation needs to occur. Then based on that data, we can create uh, areas that are protected. And luckily in Maine, we have laws that protect certain vernal pools, um, okay. many significant vernal pool program, where basically if a vernal pool meets certain conditions, it can get certain protections. Uh, basically, if somebody wants to develop close to that pool or on top of it, they have to get the okay from the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, basically, it's just like a couple extra things to help make sure those pools don't get destroyed. But natural areas are only worth so much unless they're connected, because essentially these are islands, right? They're surrounded by roads and things can't reach each other. Things can't migrate. You can't get genetic flow. You can't get nutrient flow. Uh, you can't access certain resources on either side of the road. So it's important that we connect these things. And actually, this is becoming even more important now as our climate is changing a little bit and species need to be able to adapt to the environment around them. Um, if things aren't so good on this side of the road, it might be better on that side of the road. So maybe there's more moisture or temperatures are better on the other side of the road. Uh, but being able to connect these two patches of habitat or any number of uh, patches is essential to ensure long-term persistence of amphibians and essentially any other species that are being impacted by roads. Um, and by the way, to that tunnel right here, I, I recognize it's a little bit hard to see because of the, the color being bleached out a bit, but um, this is one of the first tunnels built for salamanders in the United States. Um, hey, Audrey, that's not a safe thing to do. That might fall over. Can you come back and sit in your chair? Yeah, you can't sit there because that's a couch that's flipped upside down. Yeah. Can you come back and sit? I don't know, but you got to stay your seat. Um, so this is one of the first tunnels of its kind in the United States. It was built, I believe, in the 80s or 90s, and it's in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, and it's a simple design, but it's been very effective, and it's uh, allowed us to learn a lot about how uh, these crossing structures will work. Basically, we have these big walls on either side of the tunnel that will help guide amphibians to the entrance of the tunnel. Um, and then notice, too, that there's slots on the top of the tunnel, and that's really important because amphibians need to be able to get moisture in there. Without those slots, those tunnels tend to dry out and things tend to build up in there. Um, amphibians won't use it. 
Um, but they are able to access that tunnel and get through the tunnel, uh, crossing the road safely without being hit by cars. And that's been a fairly successful project for real. So I'm going to talk to you about the collection part of this because this is something that you can all get involved in. This is Maine Big Nights, um, or uh, I abbreviate it MBN because it's a mouthful otherwise. But Maine Big Night is a community science project that uh, anybody can participate in. Basically, you go out, you survey for amphibians with your friends and family. And as you survey, you get to help them cross the road safely. And then in turn, we'll take that data and try to apply it to the long-term conservation of these species. So I'm gonna walk you through how this project works a little bit. First of all, talking to you about the goals of the project. Number one, being identifying the significant and vulnerable amphibian migration routes around the state. Number two, we want to provide direct relief of road mortality on amphibians, which that's a fancy way of saying we just wanna scoot them across the road safely. And three, this is something that's um, we don't want to overlook, but we want to provide an opportunity for members to participate in conservation and natural resource sciences. Um, luckily, there's been a lot of pushes to get all sorts of these other backgrounds of people involved in the natural resource sciences. Um, but certainly the uh, opportunities that have existed are becoming less and less used. So for example, hunting and fishing, both of those have been declining in membership over the past few decades, and uh, we're trying to find new ways to get people involved in wildlife science. And this is a way to involve people in a group of animals that have essentially not had uh, people recreationally interacting with them before. So how this project works, we first of all identify the sites that need to be surveyed, and then we train up and certify volunteers. It's a very simple training process. Um, volunteers adopt the sites that they want to survey, and then you go and collect and report your data. It's a pretty simple strategy. It's essentially how all other community science projects work. Um, the training is also relatively straightforward and it's self-guided. Basically, you take a short online training. Um, it's depending how fast you read. It could be 20 minutes or it could be around two hours. Uh, we just have this like online handbook, basically. Then you take a, an online training quiz. You can take it any amount of times. Uh, you can take it open notes as well. Then you sign a liability waiver, basically saying if you get hit by a car yourself, you're not going to sue me. Please don't. Um, and then you adopt the sites that you want to survey yourself. Uh, we do require for safety purposes, all volunteers to have high visibility uh, vests and flashlights. And on that note about the required equipment, uh, we recognize that it's kind of hard to get some of that gear, especially if you go to Walmart and you see that a high visibility vest is for some reason like 30 bucks at Walmart. Um, I don't know why they're so expensive there, but you can buy them on Amazon for like five bucks a piece. But, you know, let's say if you can't access the gear that you need to participate. Um, community science is something that should be accessible to everybody. And this is something that we take to heart. So we actually put together these uh, main big night uh, participation kits and we deliver them to areas around the state and included in those kits, by the way, are these awesome ID cards. Um, these are life-size watercolor drawings by uh, Mike Boardman. Perhaps some of you know Mike Boardman and uh, his um, company Coyotes, but um, they are also waterproof. So if you're out on a big night, these aren't going to be, you know, disintegrating in front of you. Um, there's also a, a nice little measuring um, ruler on the bottom there so you can measure whatever you're finding. But um, they're included in these kits. And then we also have high visibility vests, clipboards, headlamps, uh, data sheets, anything that you would need to participate in main big night. You can check these out for free. Um, and we do have... Um, places around Maine that you can check these out for free, including here at UMaine Farmington. Um, it, we've actually added a few more places since I made this map. I think we're up to, let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've added, I think, three since I made this map. Um, so hopefully, no matter where you are surveying, we can get you some free equipment. And I am still trying to get something up in the county um, and trying to fill in central Maine a little bit more as well. But um, Wherever you are, hopefully you can get that equipment for free. All we ask is that you just return it by the end of the season so that other people can use it in following seasons, or perhaps you can reuse it. Um, and speaking of sites too, we have over 500 sites around the state. Um, all these little yellow dots are where we have sites. And you probably noticed that sites tend to land where people are. And that's for two reasons. That's because where development happens and people survey for vernal pools and they report where these vernal pools are, 
Um, that's how we find most of our sites, but also volunteers tend to report sites uh, whenever they're out driving, like, oh, I saw a bunch of salamanders at this site, and they'll tell us where they saw that, and we'll register that site. Um, and I'll show you soon how many of those we've actually surveyed. So on an average big night, you might be, let's say you're certified, you're ready to go, you're watching the weather, and you get trained up, you're ready to rock, and then you wait, and 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 then maybe tonight, but then you wait, nope. You get a lot of false calls, but then the nighttime temp, it might land at about 45 degrees, it might start raining right at the right time, the ice and snow has been gone for a week or two now. And as you drive up and get out to your sites, you might end up with a night that looks like this, where you're just crawling with amphibians. They're coming so quickly that you can't even record data accurately. Um, sometimes you could be moving, you know, maybe five amphibians in a night. Sometimes you can be moving 12. Sometimes you can be moving 50. The most I've moved in a night was 180. Um, that was over the course of, I think, two hours at a site in Unity. But uh, some people have actually moved more than that. I, I think there was one site that moved, I think, 230 last year. Um, so you can have these really explosive big nights. And most of those tend to be peepers, by the way, but you do uh, get quite a few of the others. So when you have so many amphibians moving and volunteers out there, um, fortunately, you are making a real difference for these amphibians. Um, again, you can be moving hundreds of these guys and you can have a real conservation impact. So for example, um, there was a really cool study out of uh, Monmouth University. A guy did some modeling in 2019 where he found that volunteers helping amphibians cross roads can actually help them persist in that area for decades, uh, decades longer than if they weren't there. Um, so we are making a real impact by being out there. And what's also interesting too about that study is they found that the most efficient thing you can do is go out in pairs if you get more than two people at a site, you tend to become a little bit less efficient. So having about two people at a site means that you're getting the most amphibians per person kind of thing, um, just in case anybody wanted a little bit more of that statistical information. But I'm gonna share with you a few of the results of our project to date so far, because we've accomplished a lot. Um, some numerical totals so far, we've had 22,000 or close to 22,000 amphibians recorded so far. Um, and by the way, this is since 2018 when we started. We have surveyed for over 5,000 hours, which lands to be about 224 straight days. We have surveyed 349 unique sites around the state, including all the way up there in, I believe that's Fort Kent. Uh, but of course, we're mostly concentrated to where the people are in Maine. Um, I don't know if anybody knows people that happen to be like up in Somerset and Piscataquis, but I'm trying to get more surveys done there. Um, there's not a whole lot in this gap in Washington County, but if anybody is able to survey that patch too, that would also be very informative for us. Um, and we're estimating, and this is a hard estimate here because of how the dynamics work, but we're estimating that several thousand people have participated in the project uh, because we've had, I believe, just under 500 people get certified but most people bring at least one other person with them. Um, it, you don't have to be certified to participate as long as you're out there with a certified person. So for example, I can get certified and I can bring my kiddo out there with me. She doesn't need to be certified. Um, but sometimes people will bring their entire class out. We've had middle school classes. We've had high school classes, college classes. Um, sometimes people organize entire social events around going out on big nights. So it could be two or 3,000 people so far have participated in this project. So how are amphibians doing in Maine? What is the pulse on them? Um, we're looking at a mortality rate of about 26%. So a little bit more than one in five. In fact, a little bit more than one in four amphibians are being hit by cars as they cross. Um, and then this map too, this is something that's really interesting to me. I, I love looking at spatial information. So these are all the sites that have been surveyed so far. The size of the circle indicates how many amphibians are being found at these sites but the color indicates how many are being killed. The darker red a circle is, the more there are that are being killed. And we can pick out a few really cool trends. Um, so first of all, notice how many of the dots in Southern Maine are really small. Um, there's a few large ones here that kind of block it out, but Southern Maine is primarily these small dots, so not a large amphibian population. 
Uh, but the circles also tend to be relatively dark colored. So there's a lot more amphibians being killed in these areas in southern Maine, where there's a lot more roads and a lot more traffic. Um, same, by the way, for Bangor, we have a lot of mortality going on there. Uh, but we also have these little patches here and there where amphibians seem to be doing fairly well. So uh, out this way, uh, we have some amphibians that have relatively large population sizes with relatively low mortality rates, which is great. Um, same with getting to Hancock County. So towards like Acadia National Park, things seem to be relatively well off. Um, but again, it's the places that are urbanized with high traffic levels that we see populations being potentially smaller and mortality rates being potentially higher. Um, another cool thing, we, we published a paper a couple of years ago about how the pandemic affected amphibians, um, because when everything shut down in, uh, I think it was March of 2020, people stopped driving, right? There were a lot less cars on the road. And as it turns out, there were about half as many amphibians killed that year. There were just a lot less people allowed to drive and hit these amphibians. So we had the perfect natural experiment in front of us. And by the way, um, this finding has been highlighted from the project more than anything else. We've ended up in, I think, three children's books, one novel, and an uh, un untold number of um, online news articles. But um, this this has been pretty captivating to people, I guess, to think about, where if you just don't drive on these nights, it can actually make a pretty profound impact. So if it happens to be a warm, rainy, rainy night in spring, it seems like a real big thing you can do is just not drive. Um, I do get the question a lot of whether or not there will be more amphibians as a result of that. And that's something that we can actually start figuring out this year because amphibians have bred. They, um, their population would theoretically be increasing this year um, after the pandemic. But the odds are that things probably won't increase because traffic resumed to actually above normal levels by the summer. So uh, when all the babies had to leave the pools and go to the forest themselves, they were facing a lot more traffic than uh, what there normally would be. Um, another interesting thing we pulled from that paper, by the way, um, frogs get hit more when it's warmer and wetter, but salamanders don't. We don't know why. We have no theories why and we can't figure it out, but it's a cool finding we like to share. Uh, we've also picked out a few uh, problems that are relatively new. These are a spring peeper and a wood frog that are affected by road salt. They're suffering from edema. Basically, their kidneys are not functioning properly, and they're loading up with water, and they're not able to excrete it. So when we used to find amphibians that looked like this, we would actually be excited. We would think that these were females loaded up with eggs that were about to have a ton of babies, but as it turns out, these are diseased animals. Um, and this was something that was only described for the first time in 2019, and we're just starting to figure out where this issue occurs in Maine. Um, a few places that we've seen this happen the most are Camden and Gray, um, and I believe Falmouth as well. So these places that tend to be on the fringes of larger urban areas, but where a lot of road salting still occurs. Um, and speaking of road salt, too, another thing that's uh, affecting our amphibians is, um, oh, I forget the name of this chemical, but it, it helps keep the dust on dirt roads down and from like flying up into the air. Um, and we're starting to think that that is also affecting amphibians as well. So I don't know if y'all remember, but last spring was a really dry spring. Uh, we only had a few actual rain events, and usually that rain flushes those chemicals off the road. Because it was so dry, amphibians were just itching to move late into the season, and they moved when chemicals were still very present on the road. And unfortunately, we had several instances of spotted salamanders dying just in mass with no explainable reason until we, we dove into this a little bit more, but no explainable reason uh, why we would find spotted salamanders dead by the dozen on these roads. And if you're looking at this picture here, um, of the road, those aren't leaves or pine cones on the road. Those are all dead spotted salamanders. Um, and that's a, a road in Bath. Um, and then that individual there is uh, an individual that we think is probably suffering from the, the same exposure. Um, it's got this like kind of milky liquid coming from its mouth. Uh, we're not, this is something that we're still like learning to diagnose and look at ourselves. Uh, we don't even know that it's this chemical. I mean, it's, this is kind of a theory that we're working on, but it's the best one that we can come to so far. Um, so we've picked this up in a couple areas and hopefully it's not gonna be an issue this year given how much more rain we've had. So uh, with all this data, we're hoping to bring together this ultimate form of conservation for these guys, which would be these tunnels that go under the roads. Um, 
And basically our main goal is to identify priority sites for these because we can't put a, a tunnel everywhere where amphibians are crossing. They cost anywhere from about $50,000 to you know $50 million, depending on how big of a, a tunnel you're looking at. So we need to be careful about where we put these tunnels and how we design them. So how do we go about designing or deciding where these tunnels go? Um, we've got a few sites around the state. Hang on, I'm gonna move this bar here so that you can hopefully see all of them. So we've got a few sites around the state that seem like they're particularly deserving. Um, and I'm gonna like walk through the uh, top, I believe five sites with the highest mortality. So first of all, we have Boyd's Corner Road in South Berwick where six out of 10 amphibians are killed. It's a 60% mortality rate. Uh, Durham Road in Brunswick, about a 64% mortality rate. Center Road in Gray, 65%. Thorndike Road in Unity, 70%. And then Forest Avenue in Orono can be actually above 70%. Uh, there's multiple, we have 12 sections to survey on Orono, um, or on Forest Ave rather, and uh, sometimes mortality rates can be as high as around 80% on Forest Avenue. Uh, but is mortality rate the only thing that matters in these sites? So for example, are rare species present? How many amphibians are actually there? Is it just that somebody found like one dead amphibian and then that site has a really high mortality rate? Um, is the population likely to exist long-term with or without help? Is each site surveyed enough to be confident in that data? So uh, this was stuff that I brought into a model to present to Maine uh, Department of Transportation to say, um, this is what we think would be most deserving based on these mortality rates, based on... Um, based on rare species, based on how many amphibians are there, based on how much it's been surveyed. So everywhere that you see a star um, is a site that we've recommended to the Department of Transportation for getting a uh, crossing structure. Most of them are gonna be in Southern Maine, uh, but we also have quite a few that we're recommending up in Bangor, even one all the way up in Cal um, Calais. So we've got quite a few that we're recommending. Um, I don't know if or when they will ever get crossing structures, but it's certainly something that we're hoping for. And now that we're a nonprofit, something we're gonna try to get a little bit more, um, a little bit more oomph behind. Um, and just in my last slide here, I wanna really emphasize how important these crossing structures are. Uh, basically, if we can reconnect these populations, they can lead to amphibians being protected for decades, potentially even centuries. And we can put these crossing structures, and I, I said this would come back around, um, in places where other wildlife are being hit as well. So deer or moose, bear, whatever. And if we can do that, those structures will pay for themselves in the matter of a few years because of how much money it costs when somebody hits a moose or hits a deer. Uh, so for example, a, a structure that prevents one moose collision, collision or three deer collisions per year could end up paying for itself in the matter of about three to five years. Um, so as expensive as they are, and as much as we might look at that price tag and be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that for frogs and salamanders. If we can pair that with some other species, we can actually get some pretty tremendous benefits. Um, and if we look at, by the way, the value of how much we care about amphibians, it's potential that uh, we could get that buyback even sooner. Um, there was a cool study where people were evaluated for how much monetarily they would value turtles, and they apparently value turtles to be about $3,000 per turtle. Um, I don't know if it shakes out to be about the same for amphibians, but if it is, then that's a lot of money being lost in our amphibians. So um, that's everything. And I'm probably landing, oh, right, one minute right before the hour. So um, I appreciate all of you listening to me. Um, thank you for listening about this project and about our results so far. If you want to get involved, there's all sorts of ways that you can. Um, again, we're now a nonprofit, so we can uh, take donations as well, and they are tax deductible. Um, if you are savvy with Venmo, please feel free to scan that QR code and throw us a few bucks. Um, we're going to do everything we can to stretch that money as far as we can and hopefully eventually get some crossing structures put in place. Uh, plenty of people that I would like to acknowledge for this work as well. Uh, we've had all sorts of organizations and individuals support our project and uh, in fact too many to list. Uh, but for everyone who does either volunteer or support the project with their skills or effort or otherwise, uh, I just want to say thank you and I'll, I'll happily take any questions. Yeah. Yes. 
Yep, so there's a few things that we look for when we are predicting whether or not a migration will happen. The main thing is whether or not there is a wetland, especially a vernal pool close to the road. Um, the other thing is what is the land cover around the road? So forests tend to be the thing we look for the most. Amphibians do not like grasslands. They don't like agriculture. So, um, and of course they don't like oceans. So if one side of the road has an ocean or a farm, we just consider that's not gonna be a migration site. Nothing is gonna be crossing to or from that. Were there any questions on Zoom? I might be able to get it here. Yeah. Hmm. I am the zoomer. Uh, it could be like five or 10 feet deep, depending on the location. So that, yeah, they're usually not digging themselves, but they're utilizing the burrows that already exist from other creatures. Um, in winter, I'd say probably around, you know, three to five feet. Because, you know, once you get below the soil deep enough, temperature maintains around, I think it's like 40 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, even if things are sub-zero at the surface. Yeah. I haven't seen it myself. Um, that's something that I really wanted to see, but something that I did experience for the first time two years ago was uh, being in the middle of the woods as amphibians yes. started emerging, and I could hear the leaves like starting to rustle around me. So like I, I would have all my lights off and be like sitting near these vernal pools and listening and you could hear a frog like start hopping in from somewhere. And I'd never experienced that before. Um, but unfortunately I've never seen one directly emerge. Oh yes, I've got, yeah, I've got a couple sites near Rangeley, but I'm certainly open to more. So if you happen to know of any new sites in that area, um, I would love to register more. Bye bye. Any other questions? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So um, Siemens Road, I think I have two. Um, McCrillis Corner, which I think is in Wilton, I think I've got one. Um, and then I know there's one or two others. Actually, um, right on campus here, there's a little pond somewhere. Is it Pleasant? Abbott? Um, I have a site right there because somebody told me a professor once reported amphibians breeding in that pond. So I, I don't know if anybody's ever surveyed that site, but um, yep, one right here in downtown Farmington. And, and by the way, too, we, we do sometimes get amphibians in these downtown areas. Um, one of the... Let's see if I can go back to my map here real quick. One of the most interesting sites that I've got is uh, in South Portland. It's this little tiny green dot right there. Um, that is a site where we have about four wood frogs remaining from what we can tell. Uh, we've gone a couple of years now without actually seeing them. So it's possible that population no longer exists, but um, there was one tiny pool left completely surrounded by urbanization with these tiny little hamlets of habitat. And actually uh, another picture that I've got as well, there was a toad picture somewhere back here that came from downtown Waterville. I saw you. I can play my Let's see. Boy, I had a lot of slides. I think it was right. Yeah, so these two right here, um, these guys were in a tiny little wetland smushed between the Hannaford parking lot and essentially what was the Walmart parking lot um, or bank parking lot, actually. The, the wetland was about the size of like this table and those couches. Um, and there were probably about 10 toads that were in there calling and mating, uh, but unfortunately, the year after I detected this population there, it got filled in and it no longer exists. Um, but it just goes to show that these guys can persist remarkably in spaces that are tiny, severely fragmented and surrounded by parking lots or other structures.
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I, you'll be joining an army of about 200 of us so far this year, but it'll probably bump up to about 300 for the year. Yeah. Thank you. How are you feeling? You feeling okay? But I didn't fall to you. Oh, thank you so much, Nancy. For your transport and all that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you. I yeah, well, I, I apologize for the background noise, but I, you know, I usually try to schedule these for when I don't have any. It's the way it rolls, right? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Okay, it is Temple, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to get his effort from that area, just, I, I don't have anybody surveying Temple, so, perfect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's awesome. Oh, yes, the microphone, yeah, there you are. Thank you. Uh, for mail it? Hello. Uh, yes. Um, I can write it down for you. That's like, yeah. Do you have a pen and paper? Or maybe I can write it on the back of something here. What's the 